I always use my hand to describe the LGBTI community. It's LGBTI and my pinky being an I because it's a small voice. And this entire community, I have found that the intersex people don't get their issues addressed when it comes to the LGBT community. Growing up, I knew that I was different, but um, I didn't know the correct word to describe myself. Being intersex, you need to be, it, 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 it affects us mentally and physically. So when we meet other people, you, you open up and it helps, it's like rehab. So that's why I had to come. I attend most of the, the intersex workshops. I love them to bits because they're informative. I mean, the more eggs of information I got in my basket, the more I'll be able to become a supporting structure to majority of friends and colleagues and people who want to learn more about uh, intersex and conditions related. ACD is International Classification of Diseases and it's a very long and complex list uh, of diseases, of disorders, of injuries that is compiled and produced by the World Health Organization. It's used as a diagnostic tool, which means that if you go to see a doctor here or in South Africa or you go to see a doctor in Argentina, they are going to use the same diagnostic language. So if you get a diagnostic here and you are traveling and you want to communicate the kind of diagnosis that you have, all doctors around the world speak the same diagnostic language. Well, I have a very special... Ha, ha, ha. It's called Major Robitanki Pirtenhauser Syndrome. I pick it up myself. <laughs> uh, it basically means that I am a person that was born with XX um, chromosomes and ex with an external, uh, external appearance of uh, a girl and without internal female genitalia. Having Mauro here was a great opportunity to help Aranti Org to facilitate a space for engagement for intersex activists uh, on the continent with the issues. Um, as far as we know, there hasn't been any engagement with regard to ICD specifically uh, by intersex activists on the continent. And we wanted to be able to create a space where people could start engaging with the issues um, and discussing whether they really, uh, the diagnostic categories reflect their lived realities um, and how they impact on them in terms of medical intervention and other issues uh, related to intersex healthcare. We meet the people, you know, from you know the different uh, base at the different countries to provide information about how these codes are related or not with their current realities. ICD is supposed to be a, a global uh, tool uh, prepared by a multilingual, multidisciplinary uh, team, but it's actually dominated by Global North perspectives and all the language there don't take into account uh, regional experiences like our experiences in many countries in Latin America and I'm sure that that's experience in many countries in, in Africa. The reality is that in, in the formation of ICD in the very beginning um, and in the revision processes that have happened, often the African continent hasn't had really strong voices in those processes, which has serious implications in terms of application of the, the ICD manual. I've put my twin sister here, who's my identical twin. In fact, our hands are also stuck together. You she can show you her mm -hmm. hand. So it's got nothing to do with it. I just think that it happened, you know, by virtue of us being identical twins, that um, we were then born with an intersex condition. When I reached puberty, then I, I, I 
anticipated that there would be more physiological changes that would be happening to me as it happened with other girls. So then, but I saw a delay in things like menstruation. Then it got a little bit uh, of a concern deep down in my heart. But then because of my twin sister, then we were both, I mean, both in the same boat. So we got worried. It's just that because there was a lot of challenges in growing up with that. I mean, you did not know how to, or, I mean, how to further find out uh, I mean, solutions to that or answers to that. Then as soon as we started working, we started to get medical aids and then we ventured to that, to finding out. In, in fact, I went to see a doctor who told me that I was born without a uterus. My own doctor at the time, when the time came that I approached him and I asked why is it that I, was, you know, I did not have a uterus and all of that, he, was, he, he became very, very limited when it came to the information that, you know what, basically this is the only case that have ever in my medical profession is the first time that I have found someone that we've been studying about in, in, in our textbooks. They did bloods and then they also did what they call karyotyping. Then it came back as X and Y. So she then told me, fortunately it took like a month. Then I took come back there alone and then she told me, yeah, you might be having a condition called androgen insensitivity syndrome, which is part of family of intersex conditions. While in the midst of that, my sister also got a diagnosis as well. So she said, okay, hang on, I think I, got, I know what we have. Androgen insensitivity syndrome, meaning that androgen is insensitive in your body completely. Instead of you having genes of a male that then develop into, into you becoming a male, those have failed, your body has, has become insensitive. They have absolutely not read any of those. And then you basically then come out as a female, with a female brain and everything, and you then live life partial. So you're basically in between, walking in between the male and female. ACT10 doesn't include the word intersex and we don't necessarily want that word to be included as a diagnosis. What we need is that the categories that are included in, in, in ICD and that concerns intersex people uh, have better names and, uh, and, and we want them to have better definitions, definitions that are not stigmatizing, that are not uh, pathologizing. For example, congenital malformation of genital organs. So this is one of the main places where intersex related diagnosis can be found. ICD describes uh, body in a, in a very ugly way. It talks about malformation, it talks about abnormalities, it talks in terms of, of disorders. There is nothing something as a congenital presence of vagina here. <laughs> Having a vagina <laughs> as, as a whole, <laughs> but it's the absence. That's the way in which we learn and which doctor learns that, you know, having a vagina is good unless you're a man. And or, you know, not having one is a pathology. It's not only it's not a pathology, but it's, but it's in the chapter of malformation. So when you read the ICD, it has, the document produces a very strong discipline in the way in which you learn how wrong your body is. The descriptions are so negative that even when there is nothing in ICD prescribing surgery, that, that kind of definitions that kind of description of our bodies are really calling for intervention. Doubling of vagina is also absent is wrong and having two is wrong too. <laughs> so not having what they have is wrong, but having two of what they have is also wrong. I was assigned as a girl when, uh, when I was born and, and, and raised as, as a girl. Uh, I started to identify as some, something different as a girl when I was uh, a child, but when I was starting to be a, a teenager, it was discovered that I didn't have internal female genitalia, basically that I didn't have a vagina. And for my my doctors and my therapists, it was a clear link between not having a vagina and not identifying as a woman. So they they made this strange connection, like if they provide me one. Uh, by doing a surgery, I will start identifying as a woman. ICD doesn't say anything about how these bodies have to be treated. In that sense, it seems that ICD is neutral. What we are saying is that, but if you are saying that not having a vagina is pathological and having two vaginas is, is pathological, basically what you are 
you know, saying, you're pointed out in the direction that having one is the right way. And we have doctors all around the world saying, well, if you don't have one, that must be corrected. We are hoping to get better language and to get rid of that kind of very binary and normalizing descriptions of body, but we also need to question, it's exactly what we are doing right now, to question this kind of, of categories and descriptions um, to separate them from treatment. So even if you describe a body as, you know, lacking a vagina, there is nothing they are saying that that's a problem in itself, unless the, problem, the, the person said, well, you know, I have a problem, I want to have a vagina. Um, in my case, I didn't want to have one. I was forced to have one. There is always that element of they are trying to correct you, they are trying to fix you, they are trying to, should you not do this, then you are not going to be acceptable in a society, you're not going to be normal. I was then born with um, um, uh, uh, internal testes that, that never descended. So they are basically hidden inside me and the doctor who first diagnosed me said, oh, by the way, you're born with, with testes. We're going to remove them because they will be cancerous later. So then he removed them. In the meantime, I did not even realize that they were doing a good job of giving me, um, they, they were actually okay for my body. You know, there are other genes that are good, such as um, for me not to get hot flashes and, you know, and, and, and the whole entire spectrum of things that happen. So immediately you are supposed to put me on a hormone replacement therapy because now he has taken something that has been producing certain hormones. So he's supposed to be putting me in a therapy. And again, yes, I know he would debate to say that, you know, at the time that we did it, we had to sign a consent form. But only if I understood what I had, I would have decided. I know that with my twin sister here, she has not undergone such an, an, an operation because it's her right not to. Especially with early interventions, people who had surgeries when they were um, children or babies, People have scars and they, they can't explain what happened to them. They don't have access to their own um, medical records. Which is really a violation of the right to identity and to the right uh, to truth, to, to know, you know what happened uh, to you. We advocate for work such as do not remove anything. Do not try and patch and cover things. Let a child grow. Let them have a freedom to decide where they would like to, you know, where, where their journey takes them and then they can decide to close or to remove or to, you know. There is no way, you know, of, of getting uh, a perfect body out of normalizing uh, surgeries. I'm saying this because it's a very common fantasy. Sometimes uh, doctors and sometimes parents, especially doctors and society in general, they believe that bodies can bodies can be normalized and there is, n there is not going to be any trace out of normalization, but actually this kind of normalizing procedures always um, leave a trace in the body, in the mind, in your feelings. It's impossible to delete the experience of having your body, you know, change without you consenting that, that change. People in a way or another remember or have nightmares or have scars or pain. Several operations were done to try to normalize me. I still don't know what normal means. My parents fought all the time because they disagreed on my gender. Mom wanted me to be raised as a girl and dad wanted me to be raised as a boy. At one stage, I changed names from Temba, a male name, to Tembelani, a gender-neutral name, and then Tembani, a female name. I missed out on so many things that young kids do. I was deprived of proper, precious, and important privileges of childhood and innocence. I wasn't allowed to play undress or even swim with other kids because my genitals looked different from theirs. There are times when I wish I could go back and be a child again. Somehow I believe that I will do it differently. I will love myself, I will play, 
more and would accept myself earlier. Talking about it helps me uh, uh, physically and emotionally. Before I was uh, always stressed, like I had a lot of anger inside, like I'll ask, why me? Why not her? Why not him? So now I, when the more I talk about it, the more I understand that it's out of my control. Like I don't have any control over it, but I just have to accept the person that I am and uh, try by all means to move forward and uh, do the best that I can to be happy. If you cannot impact the entire world, you start within your own surroundings, you start with your own environment. Awareness, awareness, awareness. In as much as <laughs> the biggest food in the world is advertising, I mean, I mean exposure to information, access to information, I mean in all diasporas, I mean that's I mean, that's, that's the media. The more people info, are, are able to access information, is the better the stigma will reduce. So you teach only one person who can teach 10 and teach 20, and the message spreads like wildfire.